All right, welcome everybody today um, to our TUM AI lecture series. It's a pleasure to have Michael Black here. Um, Michael is a director at the NBI in Tübingen where he's leading um, an incredibly successful team of talented PhD students and postdocs. Um, of course, everybody knows Michael. He's a pioneer in digital humans. I would say he's the pioneer because without his work, it's really, really difficult to do anything. He has done a lot of methods even prior to deep learning when it comes to creating 3D models, like Simple is very popular. He's built incredibly fascinating capture setups to capture the data. And of course, lately he's also been doing a lot of stuff on deep learning and generative models with humans. Um, he's also a founder and enabler of the famous Cyber Valley. Um, I think it's thanks to him that this region is actually put on a research map right now. And this, I think, is an incredible achievement. So personally, I'm very, very proud to have such a, such a great, amazing researcher here with us here in Germany. Um, and it's a real pleasure to have him here today. Um, and I think you will be talking about um, putting realistic people in realistic scenes doing realistic things. All right. Thank you, Matthias, for having me. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. Well, I'm where I always am, of course, I'm in my, um, but I would love to be with you in Munich and I look forward to doing that sometime in the future and visiting you all. So today I'm gonna talk about um, something that pulls together a lot of work that we've been doing over many years. Sometimes it's maybe not visible where we're going. We're toiling away on small pieces of the problem and people don't really see uh, where things might. This is where we've been aiming for some time, putting realistic people in realistic scenes, doing realistic things. Uh, we're not there yet. As you see, I've added a towards to my title um, because this is still a work in progress. And I should say that even though I have a, a part-time role at Amazon, here I'm talking only about work from MPI and my, uh, my research group there. So uh, today you can easily go to render people or many other places and buy really high quality 3D scans of humans, super realistic, they look great. You can also, well, I mean, the, the nice thing about these things is they look great, but they are just static scans. Right? These are not avatars. Uh, they don't have any goals. They don't wanna do anything. They don't move. Uh, you can buy some that move, but they still don't have any goals and wanted to do anything. And you can easily get 3D scenes like this today. Here's a synthetic one, but you can take your favorite scanner and scan scenes and be great at reconstructing 3D scenes. Uh, so it's, it's getting easier and easier to get high quality uh, 3D scenes like this, but typically they don't have any people in them, which is a little bit odd because just about everything in this 3D scene has been designed to be used by people, to be people to sit on the chair and to open the cupboards and close the blinds, et cetera. Right? So our goal is to bring these things together, to be able to create avatars that know how to interact with the world and interact with it appropriately, both in terms of the physical 3D structure and semantics. So uh, this is a teaser for what we'll talk about later. To get there, I've got to tell you a long story with lots of pieces. Um, and uh, we're far from done, but we're making some progress. And, and why do we want to do this? Well, you know, animating things is, <laughs> animating people is hard. So you can either spend a lot of money or you could do it kind of badly like here. I, I mean, I don't mean to criticize this, but it's just kind of funny. Um, uh, the physical interactions with the world aren't right. Uh, it doesn't look natural. And it's hard to really automate such things. So we want to do that. We also, if we're ever going to enable augmented reality, we're going to want to put realistic human characters in scenes. And so they're going to have to understand the 3D world uh, that they're interacting with. And then of course, I'm very interested in having synthetic training and testing data for computer vision algorithms. Here's a synthetic scene I'll tell you about later in which we have the ground truth 3D pose and shape of all of the bodies in the scene. And of course, because it's synthetic, not only do we know their pose and shape, but we have occlusion masks and we can have depth maps or whatever. So synthetic training data is a super valuable thing. But more fundamentally, my interest is really driven by uh, a design us. So uh, 
humans perceive and interact with the world. Uh, they touch it, they manipulate it, they uh, move it around and are influenced by it. And I want to understand that. I want to understand how humans interact with the scene and, and with each other. And if we can do that, I believe that we then kind of have a testable model of ourselves. We have a, a, a virtual person and we can experiment with it. We could put it in scenes and see how it will react. Imagine an architectural scene where I change some property of the world, the size of the corridors or the amount of light coming in. How will that affect human behavior? We have no way of testing this now without actually running experiments with real people. So uh, I see this as an, a, a great scientific endeavor to really try to understand what it is to be human and how we behave. Okay, so that's a bit of a grand goal maybe. Uh, the field is uh, making progress along this line, both in computer vision and computer graphics in trying to understand how humans interact with objects in the scene and then place people virtually in a scene or interacting with um, things like bicycles. Uh, so far, much of this is quite limited. Um, quite often the, the results are static the people are not moving or if they're moving, it's a very scripted and small uh, repertoire of, of movements that can be made. So we're making some progress. I'm not gonna go through the details of all this related work, but um, we can certainly follow up from the references here. So how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna approach this? I, we see it as having three fundamental parts. There's the computer vision part, in which we capture examples of human interacting with the scene, human scene interaction or HSI, and hopefully doing real things and complex things. Then we apply machine learning to model this so that we can predict appropriate behaviors given a new scene or new task or previous motions or, or some goal of the agent. And then finally, we use graphics to synth synthesize this behavior. And I mean, this is useful obviously for, for example, the architectural example I gave, but also uh, uh, for creating synthetic training data. And, and basically, if we can synthesize behavior that, that we, you and I can't distinguish from the real thing, then we've achieved our goal. We've created something realistic. So that begs the question, what should we capture? If the first stage of this is capture and, and traditional methods focus on capturing the human body in terms of its joints in, in 2D or 3D. Uh, but we've argued for many years that contact is, the, is key and fundamental and contact never happens unless you're unlucky through your joints, it happens through your skin. So we really need to model the surface of the body to understand how bodies interact with the world. And to that end, as Matthias alluded to, we uh, built some fancy capture systems. This was the world's first four dimensional full body capture system that could capture humans in motion at 60 frames a second, built for us by 3DMD. And it's uh, still one of our workhorses. To give you an idea of this system, some of you may have seen this, but in case you haven't, I'll just show you. Um, this has got 66 cameras, a um, uh, bunch of stereo pairs, and then some color cameras, and it captures 3D meshes. These are just raw point clouds at 60 frames a second, but you can see it captures a lot of detail, including soft tissue motion. So given uh, data like that, um, actually, many thousands of scans now. Uh, we've collected millions of scans and um, they all get kind of uh, condensed into a, a statistical model. That's our goal. So we wanna take all of this scan data and we wanna create a function that takes a small number of parameters, for example, theta, which is the pose of the body and beta, some representation of its shape and produces vertices. And I'll walk you through what this is um, uh, now and as a, as a preview of where we're gonna, gonna go with it. So uh, this is all gonna be learned from examples and then we're gonna be able to generate 3D bodies that move to form relatively realistically with facial expressions and hand gestures and so on. So now I'm gonna walk you through this a bit old work now. This is from 2015. Um, 
and Matthias mentioned it, uh, but I think it's interesting to take you through because there's some terminology here like linear blend skinning that may not be familiar to the, all the computer vision people. And it's going to apply, we're gonna talk at the end of the talk about neural avatars. And basically the same template is going, to, everything's going to be the same as what I'm talking about now, except the things I'm talking about now are all gonna be replaced by neural networks with some big advantages. So uh, a simple body model is a template mesh. It's a bunch of vertices, T uh, pieces, um, and a bunch of uh, joints, J, these are the white dots, and some blend weights. So these uh, blend weights shown here in colors, I'll tell you about in just a minute, represented by a matrix W here. We're gonna have some blend shapes. These are controlling the shape of the body and Notice that the joints, the white dots, move as the body moves, change the shape. So this is going to capture body shape variation. The way Simple does that is it uh, puts all of the scans, we've got a bunch of these training scans I showed you, puts them into a canonical pose. So it factors out all pose variation. This is really critical, and we're going to do the same thing with, with neural avatars. Put things into a canonical pose, but back Back in 2015, what we did is we just vectorized these things. So we had a, all the vertices just in a vector. We computed the mean, subtracted it, and then did principal component analysis. Made a matrix, did PCA. And then shape is represented by a small number of linear coefficients. Beta times principal component directions U plus the mean uh, mu here. All right, so that's uh, what the simple shape space is. It's just principal component variations. And here you're seeing a second, third, fourth, et cetera, principal component of um, male body shape. All right. Now we need one more thing um, that takes uh, shaped bodies, the template, the joints, some blend weights, and uh, the pose, and produces vertices. And, and this is simple as based on linear blend scanning because it's the simplest thing that's used in the graphics community. It's very, very easy. And uh, basically it says that um, uh, if uh, I'm moving a, a vertex Ti um, according to the pose of the body theta, it's uh, position in the final in the world is going to be a function, not just of the part that it belongs to, but potentially the neighboring parts um, and their transformations. And so uh, we compute the actual pose of, a, of each vertex Ti prime as a weighted combination of these transformations. You don't have to know all the details, but these color, pay attention to the color coding. It's just some uh, representation of how influenced each vertex is by um, uh, the rest of the body. Now, linear blend skinning has some known artifacts and, and this is gonna be important again for neural avatars. So it's uh, got this collapse at the, at, the, um, at the elbows, for example. And what artists have done for many, many years is they design by hand uh, um, correctives. They're called pose correctives. They're displacements from this um, uh, rest pose. So they'll craft the rest pose in such a way that when it is posed, the actual, the right thing happens. So uh, you can see the difference here as I go back and forth. All right. So the, the, the novelty of simple was to make those pose correctives a pose of the body and to learn them. And so what you're seeing is as somebody's moving here on the left, the pose correctives being applied to her shape before the body is posed. And these are capturing soft tissue motion, muscle deformation, as well as fixing the problems of linear blend skinning. Okay, and when you put that all together, you have a linear blend skinning function W, it takes a template mesh, which is a function of shape and pose, uh, the joints of the body, which are a function of the shape of the body, some blend weights, and everything here is learned, okay? but it's all applied to the surface of the body. And we'll come back to that when we talk about neural avatars. All right, uh, one more thing to say, um, that was simple. Uh, there's other models called simple H which adds hands and simple X, which is expressive. It has the 
face and hands. The hands are also correspond to a, mild, a hand model called mono and the face to a uh, 3D face model called flame. But everything is still the same. It's all linear blend skinning and learned uh, pose correctives, et cetera. All right. Uh, now, that's a model of the shape of the body in 3D. But to create virtual humans, we have to model how they move and what. And so that means capturing, because um, we don't want to be, we don't want to hand animate these things. So, uh, the goal is to be able to take things like 3D scans, motion capture data, words, even images, videos, RGBD, and produce people. Uh, the secret decoder ring, of course, is your favorite uh, neural network of the day. Um, and uh, we've done a lot of work on this topic, you know, take an image and produce the 3D pose and shape of the person, including the face expression and the hands. Um, we have a bunch of work out there, simplify, HMR, spin, vibe, expose, et cetera. And I'm not really going to talk about this today. With one exception, I'm going to plug our latest work, which will be at CBPR, and it's called Touch. Uh, and the uh, idea here was that current methods, for example, spin on the right, don't know anything about self-contact. And um, we touch our, our, our faces something like, uh, I don't know, constantly, basically. You're probably, uh, I'm touching my hands here. You're probably in self-contact. Uh, right now. And um, yet current methods do a very bad job of estimating pose when there is self-contact. And uh, so we trained a method to uh, improve that touch. And you can see the improved contact on the blue mesh compared to the purple one. And the cute idea was to collect a novel training set that we call mimic the pose or MTP. So what we did is we uh, collected a lot of 3D scans of performing self-contact poses. So we know the ground truth pose of the body and the ground truth contacts between the vertices of the body. We show these to people on Mechanical Turk from three different views. And we also highlight the areas that are in contact for them. And then we ask them to make that pose and have someone take their picture. Okay, so that's what you see here. The, pictures from Mechanical Turk. They also tell us their height and weight. So we have a rough idea of the height and weight of the person. And we have a very strong prior on what the pose should be, in particular, what the contacts should be. And then uh, we solve for the pose and shape of the body using our simplify method, but modified to take into account a very strong prior and the contacts. And then we get really pretty good quality pseudo ground truth. Uh, and the interesting thing is that if you um, use data like this and this information about contact. There's a lot more I'm not telling you about. Um, training on, on, on the contact information improves your results on pose estimation, even when there is no contact. So that's coming to CDPR and you can find it online. Uh, but still getting accurate human behavior out of images is still a little hit or miss today, I have to say. We have not fully solved that problem. And the best source of data about humans and how they move today is still good old fashioned marker-based motion capture. So again, we apply our secret decoder ring and we take marker data, the green dots on the left, and we're going to estimate a 3D body on the right. And this is, uh, again, relatively old work uh, called MOSH in which we take mocap data and we fit simple or simple X to it. This is just some examples of the CMU uh, data set. And um, using that technique and extending it a bit, we created something called the AMASS data set. And AMASS in other data sets, and we're expanding that significantly uh, very soon with over 45 hours of high quality mocap data with lots of variety. And so this is now 45 hours of mocap is now sort of in the scale of uh, what you need to do deep learning. And it's all in a single format. It's all in this simple H uh, format. So very easy to use. Uh, with that, another teaser for CDPR 21, if I can squeeze this in, um, it's uh, work on what we call Mojo. Uh, which um, 
takes a sequence of human motion and predicts the future. What are you going to do next? Uh, it has a couple of interesting novelties. Um, one that I like is that it, it, instead of predicting the joints of the body, it predicts the surface of the body, surface markers. And this turns out to be advantageous uh, for several reasons. But one is with, at every time instant in an iterative prediction, we can project back onto the space of valid bodies. So we always have a valid body, um, uh, which, is, uh, which really helps. Anyway, have a look for, for Mojo at CDPR. Okay, um, so we can get mocap data. So we can figure out, we can, we can get accurate motions of the human body, but we still have a problem if we want to model avatars interacting with the scene. And that is we don't know what people are doing in the mocap data. It's rarely labeled. And if it is labeled, it's not labeled very accurately. And so what we would really like is to be able to have detailed labels of every single frame and know that somebody's standing and then transitioning to a run and then jumping over something and supporting their body and so on. So uh, we created Babel, which will also be at CBPR. And we took the mass videos of mass data set and made little videos of them uh, and then had mechanical Turk workers uh, label every single frame. They can add any number of uh, of actions that are present in the video. Uh, they label uh, the precise timing. Um, every frame is labeled. So quite often there are transitions shown in blue here. Multiple actions can happen at the same time like kneeling down and tying your shoelace. Uh, and so it's, a, it's a quite a rich uh, data set of actions. And just here's a, just a couple examples. Teeth pose, transitioning, walking, uh, standing, grabbing something, transitioning, placing something on a shelf. And here, the woman on the right is adjusting settings on her, on her phone, adjusting settings of device by right hand. Uh, so quite detailed things. But one thing to notice in both of these is it's classical mocap. It's just the body. There's no, uh, um, there's no objects. This, this guy's grabbing an item and placing an item, but we don't see the item. And she's typing into some device and we don't see the device. So this is a, a, a major limitation of existing mocap. So uh, at ECCD last year, we uh, um, put out a new data set called uh, Grab, which we, in which we tried to address this um, because we want to know how humans manipulate the environment. And again, computer vision methods on their own are not quite good enough yet to do this. And so we um, embarked on what I think was a complex motion capture process where we would capture the whole body, the articulated finger movement, the facial expressions, the objects people are interacting with, and all of the contacts in great detail. And in particular, we're interested in full body contact. You know, you don't just pick up a cup. A lot of computer vision out of things just look at like picking up a cup, but you pick up a cup to do something. You bring it to your mouth and then you make contact with your lips. Uh, before you break contact and put the cup back down, or you bring a camera to your to your eye, you bring food to your mouth, um, you lift heavy objects with your whole body. So um, we uh, uh, 3D printed a bunch of objects, put mocap markers on them, uh, and then had ten subjects doing a bunch of different things with them, and this results in a, a lot of interesting contacts. So here, for example, is uh, someone talking on the phone. There's contact with the ear. There's contact with the phone. The contacts are highlighted in red here uh, so that you can see what uh, drinking from a bowl, for example, your contact with the bowl and with your hands and the mouth. Um, and so just here's some examples of, of the kinds of motions you get out. Very natural. On the objects, you're seeing the contacts highlighted in red. And of course, we have lots of people contacting the same objects, so we can compute uh, statistics about what kinds of places people touch objects and how they hold them and, and so on. And so Grab has a lot of information uh, like that in it. So using that, we can now begin to do what we wanted to do, which is to train uh, an avatar, in this case, just the hand, a mano model to interact with the world. 
So we need a representation. So we have a representation for the hand. It's this 3D mesh, which is like simple, but we need a representation for the world, the objects. And for that, we use something called uh, basis point sets. Basically, this is a fixed set of points in the world and distances to the, the shortest distances to the uh, object surface. That gives you a vector that describes um, object shape relatively well. And then we train uh, a neural network, two neural networks. The first one's a course net, which takes in the wrist position and orientation, as well as this basis point set representation um, and trains an encoder uh, to represent that in a low dimensional latent space. And then we train this in a conditional way so that conditioned on the um, an object shape, we decode the hand pose um, uh, of the fingers of the Mano model. So now given a new object and a wrist uh, orientation and, and location, we can uh, conditionally, we can sample Z um, given the, uh, and given the object decode a hand pose. It's not super accurate, however. And so we have a second step, a refined net that iterates and takes in addition to the initial um, hand pose, it takes the, uh, it takes distances from the finger, the hand to the object, weighted by the likelihood of contact on the object and, uh, and then gradually refines the hand till it makes a nice pose. And so here's some examples of grab net results for objects that were withheld during training. It's not perfect. Uh, there's still some interpenetration. Um, it's always tough uh, to completely resolve that. Um, and they may not be completely semantically meaningful. Okay, so we're making progress. Um, we can now uh, grasp some things. And, and that's, a, that's critical, but people move in and interact with much larger scenes. So, um, you know, these objects exist in some context. So we wanna capture human movement in a, in a larger environment. And uh, so we captured 21 subjects interacting with scenes um, from around Max Planck. And we captured them and the scene. We also scanned uh, 12 scenes. Um, shown here, and we also use the pie graphs data set, uh, and, um, and that gave us a bunch more scenes. And then we uh, used our fitting methods, uh, in this case, um, simplify X, but we extended it to uh, fit, uh, to use depth data as well as um, RGB data. And on the left, you see input image, uh, middle, you see the overlaid um, simple X body, and on the right, the 3D scene and the body rendered. So, um, yeah, so this, in addition to estimating the pose, we estimate the contacts um, with the world. And in doing the fitting, we introduced a couple of things which helped a lot. We penalize both self penetrations, so um, shown here as, as red in the under self, and also interpenetrations with the scene. But you don't want to just prevent penetrations. You want to encourage contact when things should be in contact. So in this case, we manually label uh, vertices on the simple X mesh that are often in contact with the world. And when these things were sort of close enough to scene surfaces, they would try to snap to those. There'd be a penalty if they were close but not snap on, right? And so here in the case uh, on the right, you see feet floating off the floor if we don't use such a contact term. But with such a contact term, those would sort of get sucked down and, and try to be in contact with the environment. Uh, with that, we created the, this prox data set. Uh, it's not perfect, um, but it's people interacting with uh, scenes, um, various kinds of contacts. I'll just skim through here a little bit, to see randomly what um, people are doing, touching the world, um, sitting on things, interpenetrating a little bit, um, uh, soft surfaces are a little bit problematic since we don't model them, their model is, is rigid. 
But anyway, maybe this gives you an idea of the uh, kinds of motions and the, the sorts of scenes and the kinds of contacts that go on in the Prox data set. It's a bit jerky and, um, but still we found it to be quite useful. Okay, so now with all of that, we can come back to our goal, which was to uh, take realistic looking people and put them into realistic looking scenes. So how do we leverage all this stuff we've been doing to, to do that? Well, uh, here's, here's, where we, here's where our thinking is. It's not just enough to have a 3D body that's realistic. You have to know how bodies interact with the scene. So you need some kind of representation. That representation could be centered on the scene, but in our case, we've decided to represent it in a body centric way. So what do I mean by that? So uh, look at this figure here. The pink is the just the mesh. Um, the blue areas on the left correspond to parts of the mesh that might be in contact in this pose. And on the right, are semantic labels for what those contacts might be. The feet might be in contact with the floor, the person's bottom might be in contact with the sofa, and their hand might be in contact with the table. This is encoding contact and semantics in the body representation. So this is the nugget of the idea. Uh, and uh, the way we do that is given vertices, of the, so we've got a mesh, We've got all these simple meshes in, or simple X meshes in the prox data set. So we have the vertices of those meshes. We measure the contacts and the semantics, what people are in contact with. So we get these feature maps for describing every vertex. We encode those to a low dimensional latent space, Z. Uh, and then uh, conditioned on the pose of we decode those to come up with feature maps for all the points on the body. So this is a conditional variational autoencoder where the conditioning is on the, po the vertices of the body. And these are pose vertices. So, uh, well, I'll show you an example. So here, given a pose, we can sample from Z and we'll get plausible contacts, blue, and semantics, the colored stuff. Um, and every time we sample, from the same pose, we'll get slightly different contacts and semantics. So you're lying down, you're probably lying on a bed. You're standing here, you've got your foot on the floor. Um, your hand is on the wall here where you're pointing potentially. Uh, here you're sitting on a chair uh, and with your hands on the table, for example, okay? So now armed with this representation, uh, we have a method called POSA that takes, you give us a simple X mesh, we sample the Z, and for that pose, we generate a feature map and a contact, so contact and semantics. Then we have a, an optimization technique that searches the scene for places where those things hold, where those contacts, where that person's bottom is uh, on a chair and the feet are on the floor, and then, uh, optimizes the pose of the body to fit in the scene. We allow the pose of the body to vary a little bit uh, such that it, it doesn't interpenetrate the scene, but it stays close to the original pose. And then here's some examples of automatically putting people in scenes with posa. Uh, so we, um, you know, the, the things kind of make sense. Okay, somebody's sitting on a table instead of uh, a chair, uh, but, it kind of makes sense. So what about closed people? So, so far I've shown you these minimally closed bodies and putting them in a scene. We want to take a realistic mesh, like these render people meshes here on the left and put that in the scene and not, not these you know minimally closed gray um, simple X bodies. So here's the key idea. We fit simple X to 3D scans. In fact, we got, 4,240 3D scans from render people, 3D people, human alloy, and AXYZ. Um, we extended the simple X model to children because uh, it doesn't cope with children very well. Uh, and there's a lot of children in this data set. 
And then we fit the body to these to get ground truth shapes. So on the left, you see the, the uh, simple X body. In the middle, you see the um, a rendering of the scan. And on the right, you see the, the body and the scan together. So um, let me tell you a little bit about how we do this. Uh, we take the scans, the input scans, and if we, if we know the subject and there's multiple examples of the same subject, we'll, we take advantage of that. So here we have two scans of the same woman in different clothing. We render them from many views using open pose. Uh, we use a multi-view version of our simplify X method um, and those multi-view uh, uh, 2D key points to um, fit, to get an initial good. We also extract semantics using graphonomy. Uh, sometimes we have ground truth. Randra people has ground truth skin regions. We get the skin regions and the clothing regions. And in skin regions, we expect the body shape to be very tightly fit to the scan. And in clothing regions, we expect the body shape to be inside the scan, but um, you know, not too far. We don't want it to be outside the scan. And if we know that we have the same person in multiple scans, we know that their body shape is the same. Their beta parameters are the same. So we exploit all of that and, um, and get the results on the right. And the average surface distance error is around five millimeters, which I think is good enough to really think of these things as, as ground truth. Certainly five millimeters is less, a, a much lower error than any sort of clothing measurement uh, system we would care about. All right, uh, so now armed with that, if you give us a body mesh, uh, we'll, we could fit simple X to it. Then we just do what we did before, which is a sample feature map, do this optimization, um, put the scan in the scene. But this case, we don't update the pose of the scan. We could just keep it as free. And with that, we could take a scene like this, um, put the simple X body in there, and then just swap out the, uh, the simple X body and replace it with a render person body. Okay, and you may see it's not perfect, um, make some mistakes, but it has a has a feeling of, of realism. Here's just another example of a scene, uh, people doing what they're doing. Uh, we can also do it on scan scenes, for example, from the replica data set, uh, plausible, um, plausible uh, poses of people. But it doesn't always work, of course. Here's another example, which looks good on the surface, so I mean, she's sitting in a chair at a table, it all looks pretty good, but she's holding a knife and fork and she's got no food. I mean, we don't know anything about knives and forks and we don't know anything about food. So, you know, really push this, we would need a much richer semantic um, description of the scene and of the objects people interact with and what it is people actually do. People do actually eat in front of their computer, so that's plausible, um, but she's gonna go hungry without some actual food there. Anyway, uh, now we're making some progress about putting people into scenes. And I told you one of the things that I'm excited about is using this to generate synthetic training and testing data for algorithms, for example, that estimate human pose and shape from images. It's very hard to get ground truth data, particularly of human shape in images. So we've created something called Agora, which is also at CBPR. It's a data set of realistic scenes and realistic lighting with multiple people um, uh, with occlusion, uh, interperson occlusion, environmental occlusion, where we have ground truth, simple X bodies and segmentation maps. And we have a training validation and withheld test set. Uh, so the scenes kind of look like this. Um, so, relatively realistic people, uh, lots of occlusion, um, a variety of settings, and as I mentioned, environmental occlusion, uh, people holding things. Um, and this is just some example uh, images from the data set, give you an idea of the variety, the kinds of lighting and, and so on, the scenes that we have. And we use a variety of kinds of scenes. We use these high dynamic range panorama images <clears throat> and put people in there. We also have uh, CG scenes uh, like the three shown um, 
around here. We have 14,000 training images, lots of different bodies. Um, and uh, with the training images, you also get the segmentation maps. Um, we could, people could compute intersection over union. We have the ground truth segmentation and then with occlusion, uh, we have evaluation code and a web-based evaluation server. It will be online before CPPR for sure, um, but it's, it's almost ready. Interestingly, so whenever you have a synthetic data set, you wonder, is it realistic enough to be useful? Uh, so we did a lot of experiments there. And one of the things we did was we took, uh, for example, spin, which is a popular pose estimation method, pre-trained and then fine tuned on this data set. And, uh, and then we tested it on a real data set, 3DPW, which is in the wild. And we found that fine tuning spin on the Agora data set actually reduces the errors significantly on real data. So that's a, that's a nice thing. The 14 and the 24 here, by the way, is just the number of joints being used. Um, Agora uses 24 joints, but the literature uses a weird 14 joint error, which they shouldn't be doing, but what can I do about it? Um, Agora going forward, we use the, the standard 24 joints, it's simple. Uh, and another thing you'll notice here, we also tested this method on the Agora data set. And of course it, it does better than, than spin um, without fine tuning, but you'll notice that the errors are much larger. This is the mean per joint um, error and uh, it's significantly harder. So this data set is significantly harder than existing data sets. Why is it harder? Well, oh, here's just a bunch of methods run on the data set. We did an extensive evaluation of current methods. Um, and uh, it's hard because of occlusions. It's hard because there's children in, in it, which most methods can't deal with very well. And uh, there's a huge range of scale. You see people in the far distance, little tiny people and people up close, uh, people in the periphery, um, yeah, so what we found is uh, there's a bunch of things we found out about the, the current field, but number one is that methods uh, begin to fail when there's a lot of occlusion. And we want to encourage the community to actually address not just the problem of pose estimation and when you have a detected bounding box of a person, but to also find all of the people. And so we came up with a, a new error measure that will take into account um, when methods actually don't detect people or detect them false, false positives and false negatives. And we think it's a more realistic measure for the community going forward. Anyway, that's a, a little um, overview of, of how you can use putting people in scenes to generate training and test data. Uh, but let's come back to the movement. So um, I talked about a mass and how important it is that people move and then I went back to all these static people. Uh, so we really want avatars that are realistic in uh, 3D shape and pose, but that we can insert into scenes and have them move. 4D scanning is super expensive. Building articulated avatars of people in clothing is really hard. Clothing is hard to create, it's hard to animate. What we really need are simple solutions for learning animatable closed avatars that move and look realistic. So uh, this is kind of the goal. This is a dream. This is not a result yet. Uh, so we have a we want a body and we want to be able to control it with something like simple X because it's got nice control parameters. Um, can we have something like a neural renderer that is conditioned on simple pose and or shape and can produce animated uh, people as a result. All right, so um, how do we create neural avatars from simple? Well, the standard rendering process takes a mesh, with triangles and a texture map and the camera and some lighting and, and it, uh, uses all that to produce an image. It's hard to make that really realistic and to get clothing right. Uh, so a neural renderer learns to render simple images of simple realistically with texture and clothing um, without going through the traditional uh, rendering process. Now, starting with a mesh like simple is a bit of a problem for neural networks because meshes aren't the, you know, there are ways to deal with meshes in neural networks, but it's not the easiest thing. It's 
much easier to work with images. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take the vertices of the simple model and their RGB colors. And so we're gonna have our representation of the person is going to be a bunch of points, relatively sparse points, about 7,000 for the body, and their RGB colors, that's it. And given a camera, some parameters of the camera and the pose and shape of the body, we're gonna project into an image those points, the RGB values, so three channels for each of the vertices and the depths of each of those vertices, just shown here as two images, but it's a four channel image, okay? So this is, this is very easy to work with with a neural network. Um, it's kind of weird, we flattened the world uh, in, into, from 3D into 2D, um, but you can see in the depth map, the depth values of sometimes neighboring projected vertices correspond to the front and the back. And the neural network will figure out how to take advantage of all of this. This is a, a method called simple picks, by the way, which appeared at Waxy. I actually think it's a pretty powerful, very simple and powerful method. So given the, this uh, four channel imagery, we uh, uh, use a UNet to train a neural renderer to generate an image like the one on the right. And we do that by minimizing some losses given ground truth images that we're gonna train with, okay? So the representation is really simple. I've just got a simple model and vertices. I got a mesh and some vertices. I'm gonna generate images and then basically train a neural network to fill in all the details, all the hair and the, you know, all the little clothing details and so on. So the training data is set for this. Uh, there's um, uh, there's a, a lot of scans of a lot of people. Okay, so you need that. You need to learn like what does hair look like? What do clothing wrinkles look like, et cetera? So we have a, a big training set and then a test set of 68 novel subjects. Uh, and, and so here's the input, the two images on the left. I know this all looks like 3D, uh, but it's not. They're just images, right? It's just RGB points and RGB depths color coded here so you can see it. And uh, SimplePix generates the images on the right. Okay. The nice thing is because, oops, sorry. The nice thing is because I am not good with my clicker here. The nice thing is uh, because these things are driven by simple, it's just trivial to change the, the vertices. You just change the simple shape parameters by beta and you can make somebody skinnier or fatter or give them a little belly or whatever. Uh, and the network has learned how to take vertices like that and to generate the appropriate um, rendered images. So it's a nice way to change body shape and get diversity. You can also uh, change the pose and so uh, here, are uh, test subjects animated with motions from the amassed data set. So, you know, the network has obviously never seen any of these poses before, um, uh, but it's able to generalize uh, relatively well. Okay, so at, we use simple picks for lots of things, by the way. It's really, uh, and, and Sergey uh, is going to, Sergey Prokudin, the first author, is, is putting a version of it online soon if he hasn't already and it's it's really quite handy um, but simple picks doesn't actually model 3d shape uh, it allows us to render images but it doesn't generate clothed shapes and we might still want to do that for some applications uh, clothing is complex and the topology of the clothing doesn't always match the body and it can change over time for example you can open up your jacket and so on uh, so we need a more flexible shape representation than simple meshes. And there's an explosion of research on this uh, topic right now with uh, implicit shape representations. Um, I'm just going to plug two other papers at CDPR. LEAP is an occupancy-based uh, neural avatar model. We don't deal with clothing yet there. Um, and scale is, uh, it takes a different approach, which is kind of more explicit. It's based on 3D points but combined with neural rendering, we can represent the shape, 3D shape of, um, of people in, uh, and with topologically varying clothing, which is very nice. And then we can render them relatively realistically. 
So those are two things to check out at CBPR. But the one I wanted to talk about today, because I thought it might generate the most interest is Scanimate. Uh, this is a, um, a method for learning skinned closed avatars directly from raw scans. Uh, and I'll just walk you through this because I think it's actually a template for what's a, what I'm seeing appear in the community um, in terms of neural avatars. But let's go back to Simple. Um, it, so Simple had a lot of the principles that we're going to actually use in the case of implicit neural avatars. We're gonna have a body represented in a canonical pose and we're gonna have blend weights, but rather than have them on the surface of the body, they're gonna be defined by a neural network everywhere in 3D space. So we're not gonna have blend weights, but we're gonna have a blend skinning field, okay? We're gonna model shape in a canonical pose, but that shape model isn't gonna be a mesh anymore. It's gonna be a function that can be evaluated at any point in space. For example, a sine distance function. Uh, and we're still gonna to wanna to model correctives. And, and so remember it was simple that the, the important part was that those correctives captured how the body deformed as a function of pose. And we're gonna to wanna to model how say clothing deforms as a function of pose. And then we're gonna pose the model with uh, linear blend skinning. But again, the whole thing's going to be implicit and everything's gonna be a neural network. So Scanimate um, learns directly from raw scans. What we do is uh, we fit a 3D body, a simple X, in this case, simple body to uh, all the raw scans. I'll tell you in a moment how we canonicalize them into a canonical pose. Then we're gonna learn this uh, implicit shape representation with pose dependent deformations in that canonical pose. And then we're gonna repose that using learned linear blend skinning using these skinning fields, okay? The nice thing here is that we're gonna have simple parameters behind everything. So it's gonna let us animate these things easily. We're gonna actually leverage the simple body model in a couple of ways. For now, we're gonna do this only for a single person. It's, and it's not a generative model of people the way simple is. Uh, so many methods that try to model statistical, the body statistically in clothing require a registered scan. So you have to align something like the simple topology to the scan. This is hard in the case of clothing. So we wanted to get away from that, but fitting simple to a scan is actually pretty easy. And I showed you that with the Agora data set. Um, and the simple body is going to give us some weak supervision that's gonna help us learn these skinning fields. It gives us ground truth of what the skinning weights are on the body surface. So the key idea is the following. It's this weakly supervised canonicalization. So we're gonna be given a raw scan and we have points on that scan, XS. We have fit a body to it. So we also have the body that corresponds to this and we have its surface and we have points on that. Um, uh, we could call them X, B, but whatever, they're called BS here. Um, and what we wanna do is for all of the input scans, canonicalize them into uh, this canonical pose. Uh, the way we're gonna do that is with cycle consistency and a regularization for the, uh, the body shape, uh, the, the, the blend weights on the body. So consider XS, we're gonna apply an inverse skinning function uh, which transforms XS into XC, a position on the body, same position on the body in the canonical pose. If we can do that for every point on the, from the pose body to the canonical space, then we need to, we can verify that by going in the other direction with forward skinning to re-predict where that should be, the predicted pose XP, and then we can measure a difference, okay? So what are these skinning nets? So, uh, so let's just consider the forward skinning net. Like skinning weights that I showed you for simple, there's some weight, but in this case, they're now a function of position X in, in the canonical space. And G is some MLP, it's a neural network. 
that takes a position in that space and in three space and gives back a weight. The other direction is a little more complex and um, uses a, um, a latent encoding of pose and the mesh Z, which I'm not going to go into. Um, and I just want to visualize what these look like. So here are these skinning fields. So they're no longer, I mean, if you just looked on the body, the color coding is similar to what I showed you before, but they're actually defined every place in space. Okay, and, and so you're seeing um, here in the canonical space as well as in the post space. So these are just neural networks. Um, so once we have that, we know how to take scans. There's some other details of how to deal with holes and, and so on, but to repose them. So we know the pose of the scans and we know the shape now in the canonical space. And we're gonna represent the shape of the body using an implicit function, a sine distance field, Fx. Uh, the problem of course, is that once we take these uh, scans and repose them, you know, there's lots of missing data and, and so on in the canonicalized space. So we regularize that using implicit geometric regularization. Uh, I'm not gonna go into details. It uses this fancy term called uh, iconal regularization, which basically means we're forcing Fx to be uh, a sine distance field. And um, this paper, IGR paper shows that uh, by doing this with neural networks that the um, NLP's inductive bias actually manages to smoothly fill in the holes in a very nice way, which is um, kind of slick, but I refer you to the paper for more details. Uh, so um, what we actually need here is for the shape to be pose dependent. So we have our theta, the pose of the body, and we're gonna to wanna to represent how the clothing shape varies with that. So the problem is that this theta is very high dimensional. We probably don't have that many scans to fit. So it's very easy to overfit with limited training data. And so a naive regression um, training with just the global pose parameter uh, quickly blows up if you don't have very much training data. This is an extreme case where we didn't use very much training data, but just to make the point. Um, so instead, we take an advantage of the kinematic tree and we, um, we learn to, uh, well, actually just to find it in a weight matrix W um, that is going to focus only on local parts. So if I'm in a region, near a particular bone, I'm gonna look at only the pose of that bone and its neighboring ones, several neighboring ones. So it's a, uh, this is a focus of attention, if you will, on just local parts of the body so that you don't end up overfitting to the global pose. And that little trick um, uh, solves things. And with the local approach, even training on a small amount of data, the, the thing doesn't blow up. Okay, and then because uh, the whole thing was learned with simple, we can just take uh, simple, here's from the AIST++ data set, uh, some nice motions or from a mass, and we can um, learn these avatars for different people and different kinds of clothing, and then um, put them in motion. Of course, the, I should have mentioned that the mesh is being rendered here. Uh, you have to do marching cubes or uh, something like that to get the, uh, 3D meshes out for rendering. Um, we can also learn color in just the same way. It's just a, another MLP, which is a function of, of space. We've got uh, colors during training, CX, uh, and then we're gonna minimize a, um, uh, we're gonna train this function to minimize the predicted color on the surface of the body. And so um, here's some colored meshes. Not perfect, but coming along. All right, so I'm, that's an hour. Uh, so I'm just gonna wrap up. Um, in summary, uh, a lot of the field of computer vision is focused on capturing the animating 3D pose or capturing 3D scenes. Uh, and we're really interested in putting these two things together. Um, in many cases, contact has been ignored because people haven't modeled the surface of the body. Models like Simple X allow us to do that to reason about contact. And uh, 
grab as an example of using simplex to capture and model grasping in particular. Uh, POSA, this is the, the human scene interaction method that, that um, is body centric. It makes contact a first class part of the body model itself uh, and allows us to put people into scenes in semantically meaningful ways. Um, we're rolling out Babel, which I hope people will find useful, which is a super large action uh, labeled mocap data set uh, with many, many, many actions, um, some of them very rare, um, which presents huge challenges for existing um, methods that uh, either do action recognition or synthesize actions from semantics. Uh, but I think that will help us move towards much richer semantically meaningful motions, which are necessary for putting people into scenes. And then uh, the field is kind of going crazy at the moment with neural avatars, which enable us to model things much more realistically in terms of hair and clothing and so on. But nicely, many of these things are built on the, the simple ideas of canonical post spaces, uh, shape spaces, um, uh, learning post dependent deformations and linear blend scanning just extended and updated with neural networks. Um, and when they're parameterized by a simple, it gives us the tools to hook in the standard graphics techniques that we already have to animate them. So what's next? Um, so I haven't shown you what I really want to show, uh, which is the um, synthesis of people moving in scenes, interacting with objects and actually changing the world, moving the chairs around, picking up a cup and taking it to the sink and so on. We're working on it, but uh, we still have a way to go. Um, and even further out, you know, humans have goals. Uh, the world or objects in it have affordances. Humans plan at multiple levels of how to achieve goals and to solve problems. And, and, and we just have no way yet to say, take a, a human avatar, put it in a scene and say, uh, go make a cup of coffee. And, and see what happens. That is a really an AI hard problem. And um, I think the field still ways off from, from tackling it. But we can capture, uh, one way to get there is to capture more varied behavior from video. Um, this means capturing 3D scene structure so that we know what people are interacting with, uh, as well as the semantics, uh, track people and their contacts in the scene, and the interactions between people, and uh, begin exploiting more um, information uh, that's present in, in video, like the audio. And of course, we're working on increasing neural uh, realism of uh, neural rendering and neural avatars. And with the goal, really, it should be super easy from a few images or a single scan to make an avatar and then insert it in a scene. That's really what we would like. So uh, for people who've been following along, <laughs> it's been a bit of a whirlwind. I've talked about all these different things. Um, here are links to most of the code. For most of them, the CBPR papers, some of the, some of the stuff is already out. Uh, some of the code and the data is still coming soon, but will be there certainly before CBPR. So uh, here, this is your go-to reference. Uh, and I have to say that um, Matthias mentioned that I get to work with some really great the students and postdocs, and it's absolutely true. Also some great senior collaborators. And uh, this is the team behind everything I talked about today. And uh, I'm just really privileged to get to work with all of them. And I really appreciate the chance of coming and giving this talk. And I hope there's some time for some, um, some feedback and uh, questions and answers before people head off on their vacation and enjoy maybe a a glass of wine or something. Yeah, thanks so much. Weekend, not vacation, weekend. <laughs> thanks so much. Really, okay. really fantastic work. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, th there's not, not so much to add, I guess. Really, really impressive, of course, that line of work, like how much impact also these models like Simplens are having in the community. Um, so we have a bit of time for questions. I mean, I'm going to start maybe with one, like, Simple has made so much impact right now, I think. And I think the community wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to do that kind of work on humans if this model didn't exist. So what do you think is the future to it, right? Like, what do we do beyond like linear landscaping, linear models, like yeah. maybe correctives on top of it? Is that the future that we have more correctives? Or do we 
do we start from scratch again? And what's what's the future there? What do you what do you think? Yeah, it's it, let me mention why um, simple turned out to be so useful to people. Uh, we built many models before simple, and they weren't use they weren't that useful to anybody. And I had an experience where I was showing um, our model. It was it was called Blend Blendscape at the time, I think, to folks in Hollywood. And they, they said, well, yeah, it, it looks good, but it doesn't work with any of our tools. But we can't really use it. It's got to work in Maya. It's got to work in, you know. Blah, blah. So I went back to the team and said, look, we, you know, let's start from something that's dead simple and easy that everybody can use. And so it's designed to be compatible from the get go. And, and so that's how we, we decided to build something based on the current tools. And it turned out to be a big surprise. It turned out to actually be more accurate than the fancy models that weren't based on the current tools. So the lesson there was to get things really in use, you have to find out what people actually do and, and build to that. So I'm very excited about neural avatars, except they blow that whole thing out of the water, right? They're super cool and great, but they're slow. You know, if you want to get a mesh out, which people want, it's still pretty slow to get out. Uh, they're not compatible with anything. They don't plug and play in Maya. So unless, unless we go and start building new graphics tools, which I think will happen, by the way, I think the, the world of graphics will change in this direction, but it won't happen overnight. It's going to be hard to get stuff out that is you know, really realistic, has lots of clothing, and is still super compatible and functional. So I think we don't quite have the answer yet. Um, as excited as I am about implicit functions, the implicit part is actually a bit of a problem for adoption. So I think we might need to keep looking. I think that's a good point. <laughs> I also think, I mean, we, we're gonna have new tools, I think we're gonna maybe have to change some existing just workflows, generally speaking, but this will obviously take a bit of time. It's not gonna happen so, tonight. So I, I, the work I didn't talk about called Scale, which is at CDPR also, which is based on point clouds. Um, let's not forget point clouds. They're actually pretty useful. They, they give us explicit 3D information that we can render very quick, super fast to render and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the work that Leo Gibbs' group does with, with 3D point clouds and all kinds of ways. You can really, really do a lot with, with point clouds. Um, and so I'm not giving up on them as a representation either. I think the jury's out on what's gonna be the next model. Cool, any other questions on Zoom? I mean, there's a bunch of questions on YouTube already, but um, I'm gonna give people here an opportunity to. So just um, I have a question. Hi, I'm Ziho. I'm uh, specialized Hi. on the C understanding, actually. But I think this human C interactive is very, very interesting. And also, um, I would like to ask, for example, uh, for the semantic part for this human C interactive, it seems relates to all, a lot of physics. If you grab a cap or etc. Um, but like. How do you think if you want to define a action like in the 2D video uh, recognition, you can like to use some frames to to predict if the, if a human is doing something like sitting or grasp a, a, a cup, but on the 3D, do you think it's a meaningful task um, uh, that like what a human defined, or you think it's not so interesting because? how you generate the ground truth in 3D is totally different from 2D. For 2D, you, you just take a picture. So people want to predict the action for, for this picture or a video. But for 3D, you, you, generate the, you generate the ground truth in another way, right? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think it's still a meaningful well, problem? Well, let me see if I, if I get the question. Um, so are you asking whether 3D is useful for action recognition? Or should I, because there's two skill fields and some features computer from the pixels and you can recognize sitting on a chair. Do you need a 3D model and all this 3D stuff? Is that is that your question? Um, yeah, kind of actually I want to ask is like for 3D, you can generate a, a action, right? You don't really have to predict in this way, but maybe in some scenario, Let's say if we have a reconstructed 
3D scene and a human. And we, we, we want to predict and we, we can leverage the data that are generated synthetically to do the training, right? Do you think it's a valid uh, set, set up if, if we propose, hey, we, we want to propose a task to do the 3D human action recognition where we can already generate a lot of synthetic data in that way? So, um... My, here's my philosophy about this. So, um, mm. uh, there are some actions in the world that are relatively rare. Mm -hmm. um, so when you see them, there are a lot of confounding effects about the clothing of the person and how tall they were and the lighting mm -hmm. and the scene and so on. Uh, so unless we can really factor those things out, um, learning unusual actions from pixels may be home. Whereas if I can abstract away from the pixels to the 3D structure of the world, I factor out many of the confounders uh, from the problem. Mm -hmm. And then if I have a small amount of training data about rare actions in 3D, I think mm -hmm. I'm going to have a better chance of recognizing them from the recovered 3D motions. It's only a hypothesis. Um, but when we talk about actions and action recognition in our community about wh what that really is. So action recognition is like one of the, I don't know, it's, it's, it, at the moment it's, it's narrowly defined. You, know, mm -hmm. you kind of think of some actions and then you, you go out and collect them and look for them. Actual actions are much, much, much richer than than what people collect. And, uh, and I think one notion of have we actually understood the behavior in a scene is whether we can generalize and put that same behavior in a new scene, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that it comes with all kinds of subtlety, um, which action recognition methods don't really deal with right now. I don't know if I've answered your question though entirely. No, I think it's uh, actually, I'm thinking of that's quite uh, interesting. It's like now, if we can generate synthetic data of these human actions, we can pre-training on them. Maybe there's a chance we can fine tune on even very small real data. As, mm -hmm. as you said, the, 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 I mean, you, 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 like you cannot really gen like generate a synthetic way covering all the clothing appearance, something maybe drawn with pixels. It, it, it seems very um, useful and direct. So I'll give you another example where it's super useful for us to use synthetic data for real world and apply it to the real world. And this is, we do work with drones as well where we're tracking people. Um, and there we just don't have a lot of uh, drone footage of people overhead. Having mm -hmm. synthetic data, we can change the camera configuration. We could change the type of sensor we could change the height of the drone. We could change all kinds of things and generate new training data synthetically mm -hmm. very easily. Um, it's one of the great things about this synthetic data. You can repurpose it um, yeah, that makes very sense. quickly to new scenarios. And... Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your answer. Maybe we can do one, one last question. I think Angie, you wanted to ask something, right? Thanks for the talk. Um, oh, you're welcome. Thanks. Yeah, so I had a question, I guess, relating to, again to data then. So uh, a lot of cool data sets that you have generated around collecting people and now some like person object interactions or person scene interactions that there's still, of course, the end goal being to really capture kind of complex scenarios, maybe um, learn a bit of the, the physical uh, basis behind um, human movement in, in scenes or multi-person interactions in, in scenes and do you think we can get there with the current data that that we have um and that a lot that you've provided or or what's the next data set that we need yeah it's a great question um i think and, and and so the debate in my head is do i do i ramp up traditional mocap and and extend it to much more complex interactions um uh, and the answer is probably a little bit of that, um, but I really think we need to be leveraging natural video much more heavily. The problem is we're not quite there, but maybe we're there enough that 
methods are working well enough that we can we can begin using it. What I what my group is lacking is something that uh, that you guys have um, uh, is is this really good three D scene reconstruction. Right. This is this this would really if we could just take a a movie and um, and get really good 3D scenes out and the 3D people, then, then we'd be on our path to the, getting some exciting data. Uh, these, so these things have to really come together still. I think we're just not, you know, the tools are just not quite there on either side yet to make it super practical. Yeah, but still, I'm really excited about learning from um, in the wild data. We're doing it for faces now and it's working really well. Faces are a little bit special though, um, a little bit easier than general scenes. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the learning from all the video data that we do have available um, is definitely interesting potential that uh, hasn't really been, been fully or really at the, the basics that have only been explored. So that, that's kind of cool too. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. We're already a little bit over time, so I know I feel a bit sorry for all the questions on YouTube. They were probably like 20 questions. <laughs> I don't think we can go through all of them right now. Um, I think at this point, we, we probably have to unfortunately um, close the session. Really, thanks a lot for the great talk. I mean, I hope that, you know, everybody is, um, is really as excited. I think these are really great research directions, and there's so much future work to do in building these methods. I think that, that really makes it very special, I think, for especially new researchers that are going into the field, like the interaction between 3D scenes and, and poses. I think that's great. Um, um, and there will be a lot of cool stuff coming. So I was really excited to have you today. Um, and for everybody else, we're gonna continue next week again with the next AI lecture. Um, and otherwise, um, if you're interested, of course, feel free to reach out to Michael. Um, I mean, he's a really great guy. He's very hands-on still in the research for his seniority. That's a very special thing. So thanks a lot. Thank you.